really know how to do now that we're what month, whatever into lockdown and lots of zooming. Um, I just want to say like, it, it really is great to be with you all and Friday mornings. Um, I was really attracted to the framing of this, which was, you know, short and sharp. Um, Cause I think we're all in a lot of zoom meetings and actually just getting straight to the point, um, taking on some interesting content. Really, I'm hoping to have a bit of a conversation with you all because you're all practitioners and doing this. So I feel like this really needs to be a, a conversation as much as possible. So I'll try and just share a couple of short, sharp insights um, and then really turn it over to Alexis. Um, and and um, if I, if I may, Andrew, I think, um, it's important to note that Alexis isn't just a student at Oxford. She really has been the driving force of the Regenerative and Circular Economy Lab. Um, so I, I really am going to turn it over to her quite quickly because she is really doing the work that's on the front line of where this is all going. So in terms of all of your interest in like the trends, um, I'm going to just share a couple of insights at a, at a higher level, but I would really encourage you to really tune in to Alexis because she's the one who's sort of really navigating, driving and leading, um, in my view, where all of this is going next. Um, so, so um, yeah, make sure you're, you're well caffeinated and, and tuning into what she has to say. Okay, this is that time where I'm gonna do share screen, Microsoft PowerPoint presentation, and, and uh oh, hold on a second. Uh, share, let's see. Are you guys now seeing my lovely slides in presenter view or is it in? It's not in presenter view. Yeah, no. Ah, there we go. Is that better? Now it's full slide. Yeah. Okay. Alexis is nodding. I'm going to take my direction from Alexis with thumbs up. Okay. Um, I just wanted to actually start off by sharing like one of the images and um, quotes that we use actually in the circular economy elective that we teach the MBAs at um, Oxford. This is sort of a quote that some of you guys will know. It's the wisdom from Dr. Zeus and the Lorax. And I think it's a great place to start because unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. There is great wisdom in the work of Dr. Zeus, and I encourage everybody to kind of <laughs> take some time and reread some of those epic, um, epic books. But I, I always want to start with this because you guys all are showing that you are caring. And this is what gives me hope in this wild, complicated, and turbulent world is that there are people out there who do care, and therefore I do believe that things are going to get better. Um, because let's be honest, we got some pretty mega challenges out there. Um, this is a picture of John Fullerton. He's someone that, um, if, you, if you don't know him, it, it is interesting to tune into some of his um, research that he's been working on. Um, he comes from deep, deep finance sector, so he's a managing director at big banks. Um, and then he left, and he left because he wanted to focus on concepts of regenerative economy. And I'm going to have, Alexis is going to definitely pick this up a little bit more in her remarks. But the reason why I wanted to start with this quote is because I think this is where we're at. This is why we should be caring a whole lot. And this is like the level of challenge we have, because right now there is a sense that how do we, that there's like an ex exponential growth curve. Like we keep on seeing things with like lines going up like this, the expectation that growth can keep on going. But how do we do that on a planet that has finite levels of resources? Like it, it just, it just doesn't work <laughs> as John Fullerton very clearly said. So in some ways, it's kind of like a paradox. And this is another sort of framework that we bring into this teaching at the business school is, is to talk about, well, if this idea of exponential growth on a finite planet doesn't work, well, well how do we address that? And we, we kind of look at some of the stuff that's been done around paradox thinking. And actually, Andrew White, who's a, one of the deans at the Side Business School, wrote a really interesting piece in HBR a few years ago. And his application of the idea of paradox was to understand um, how companies are um, putting purpose ahead of short-term profits. But I actually think there's something really interesting in, in this framework that he um, presented that applies to this, this challenge about the paradox of growth. And in order to address a paradox, he talks about you need to take three steps. First, you have to accept that there is a paradox. Second, you need to be able to confront it head on. And third, you then you need to work with others, I would argue, um, in order to transcend it. And I think what we are at the stage right now is since we are accepting the paradox that, that exists, we cannot lo no longer have exponential growth on a planet with finite resources. We're now beginning to confront it and really try and understand what the consequences of that are and how we need to shift and change. And I think where we're going next is how we, again, we transcend this paradox as a collective um, and together. Now, I know we're here talking about the circular economy. Um, many of you will already know the sort of range of definitions that exist already out there. Um, the one that we sort of use as a primary anchor in our work at Oxford is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I would just give a huge plug to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation because if anyone's interested in exploring case studies or examples of what circular economy looks like in practice, they have incredible resources and tools and really nice little vignettes of companies from a range of different industries. Oops, sorry, I'm going ahead there. 
Um, so I, I check out their website because they're really like a go-to source for a lot of this material. But you can see this is the definition of the circular economy they use. And again, I'm going to assume that you guys are all as, as a practitioners kind of aware of it. What I want to just draw, draw attention to is the three principles that the circular economy is based on. So again, it's about designing out waste and pollution. And I think emphasis on that word design. Designers are really critical here. Um, it's keeping products and materials in use as long as possible and regenerating natural systems. And that regenerate word is another critical one that Alexis is going to talk a little bit about. But I wanted to anchor sort of our approach to circular economy with these as sort of the three key elements. The circular economy is about really systems change and to to, rec to actually drive systemic level change, we know it's not just about the role of businesses. There's actually a range of different actors. All of them, I imagine, just I, I, I visualize it as they all have different levers that need to be pulled in order to activate a systemic change and in order to activate what we need know we need to do to address this paradox. But I think the trick is to recognize that we all need to have all those different levers pulling at the same time if we're really going to drive change. And so one of the frameworks we do spend a lot, also a lot of time talking about are like, who are the people in the system? Yes, there are businesses. And yes, we know there's an important role for policymakers and academia, designers, NGOs, activists, investors, artists, media. So we really try and expand the view of what's going to be needed to transition to a circular economy by looking at how do we bring together these different actors and again, get them to all be pulling their levers at the same time. Um, because we teach the circular economy at the business school, um, we do spend a lot of time also talking specifically about the role of businesses. And, uh, and one of like, I think the really nice modules um, that we go through is really looking at business model innovation. And I think there's increasingly a recognition that in order to look at really transitioning from a business perspective, circular economy, we do need to look at business models. And, and we have a whole thing about what are business models, how do they are, how are they composed and, and how do you change them? For the sake of this presentation, I just did want to just highlight, um, we really have been inspired by the work from Peter Lacey at Accenture, who, who's done a lot of work around understanding these business models, as well as the Generation Foundation. And they had a, a framework that involved looking at five different business models. And I say we, we sort of added a sixth actually um, to the list. But you've got um, a business models that are about suppliers of circular economy related products. So these are like renewable, recyclable, biodegradable materials that can be used in the production of products and services. You've got resource recovery. And so again, this is about really looking at the recovery of resources or energy from disposed products. So again, keeping that in the loop as much as possible. Um, product life extension, really cool experiments happening with companies like Patagonia, where you're looking at, you know, actually extending the life cycle of products by repairing them, upgrading them and reselling them. And if you're interested, Warren Ware is a really cool um, initiative of Patagonia. Um, you got sharing platforms. I mean, this is sort of, again, that's actually funny to me. You kind of look back in order to look forward, but it's like using the principle of like the libraries and recognizing actually there's ways that which we can use, um, we enable the, the utilization of products by not owning them ourselves, but sharing them and providing access to them from others. I'd say an exciting area that we're seeing more stuff happen in is like this idea of product as a service. So this is where um, you know you get access to the service of the product while retaining the ownership to internalize um, the benefits of you know the circular resource productivity. And I like that sounds like a whole lot of stuff, but I think a greater example of this is like instead of Philips selling light bulbs, um, Philips will sell access to the light that the map or not access it will sell. Um, the light that actually the bulbs produce and, and actually therefore they have to make sure they're maintained um, as much and, and as highly as possible. So I think that's a really interesting one to tune into. The one that we actually added to the, the, the business model mix was recognizing that all of this um, all of this innovation needs to be fueled <laughs> by, um, by energy um, that is obviously renewable. So we, we need to make sure that not just what are we developing, but how are we developing um, is, is, has this sort of decarbonized generation approach to it. Um, and that we're, we're capitalizing as much as we can on the needs to build um, as, as energy efficiency in everything we do. So again, I, I'm, if I had longer, I would talk through each of these as sort of like little mini vignettes or case studies, um, but I'm happy to send more material for you if you're interested in any of these business models or if you think it could relate to the business you're running. Um, I have a few examples specifically that I could talk about. We've already sort of sh shared um, a bit about Patagonia, more and where. Um, other great examples, you'll be able to find these on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website. I will just give a shout out to um, Toast Ale because I think they're really cool. They have a great line. They're like, they say, if you want to 
save the world, you got to throw a better party than the people that are des destroying it, which I think is like a great call to action. Um, but Toastdale takes bread that would otherwise be wasted and converts it into beer. Um, they are these three companies that are on this slide right here, Toast, Patagonia, and Elvis and Cressy that some of you guys might know, they make luxury um, accessories out of fire hose that would otherwise go to landfill. Um, these three companies actually are certified B corporations, which is, um, as Andrew said, the organization that I work with, which is around really looking at um, what are the businesses that are really walking the talk of, um, of, of being profit and purposeful together. Um, and there's a whole network of these that I can talk further about if there's questions about B Corps particularly. Uh, I'm going to get getting to the end because I want to hand it over very quickly to Alexis, but the last thing I just wanted to really kind of share with you all is that I think an idea that we're starting to um, nurture a little within the circular economy, regenerative and circular economy lab, is this idea of circular integration. So um, in, a, in a traditional strategy world, you know, lots of people talk about vertical integration and horizontal integration as strategies that companies can take. And what we're trying to propose through some in investigations into how businesses are approaching circular economy is, is how we could actually look at creating um, circular integration pathways. And so that is about really embedding the principles of the circular economy across the business in order to create, as said, a more closed loop and regenerative system at scale. Um, and we're, we're actually right now looking for some companies um, that are interested in almost being pilots of what a circular integration strategy could look like. So I'll put that as a shout out. If anyone's kind of intrigued by this idea, um, we'd really love to talk to you and, and see if there's ways that we could work together to showcase the journey that you're on. So I'll come back to where we started. And so someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better, it's just not. Um, and uh, I, I wanna say this is kind of one of those fun things that we actually do with students at the business school um, in our class, but also I would just encourage everybody to have these conversations um, with people that are in their community, with their family, with their friends. This is my, these are my two sons, actually, one of them who's a very big climate activist. You can see his sign that he created. Um, this will happen with climate change if we don't act now. Um, but it's interesting that when you start asking the question about some of the key messages from books like the Lorax, people do have opinions. They do take things away. Um, and, and I would just, I think a really important part of what we all need to do is absolutely embed these principles in our businesses, but to truly go through the, the transition that we know is needed, it's got to be systemic. And for it to be systemic, it needs to be cultural. And for it to be cultural, we need to be having conversations. So I would just encourage everyone to think about um, what are sort of some of the trigger questions or trigger books or things that you could use to engage with your customers, your family, um, people in your community, because ultimately this is going to be um, a system game if we're going to see this transition happen to address this paradox. Um, with that, I think uh, my final quote there is, yeah, if not us, who, if not now, when, and if not right here, right now, like where and when do we expect this change to happen? So we all have the power and we all need to, to use it. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm a optimistic and a heliotrope um, by nature. And that is because I have the great privilege of spending a lot of time with businesses that are sort of really interested in experimenting and doing um, work in the systems change space and transitioning but also I have the chance to work with the most brilliant, wicked, smart, awesome, passionate young people um, like Alexis, who I'm gonna turn it over to because she's gonna share this whole new frontier of regenerative um, systems and nature-based solutions. Um, and, and again, I just, I wanna end with the note of like, it's people like Alexis that really to me have, give me the hope and the energy um, to keep on going because when we've got leaders like her ready to take this forward, then my, my sense is we all just need to get behind um, the young people and help support them however we can because they are gonna rock and roll in this transition. Um, so Alexis, maybe can I throw it over to you um, to take us through the regenerative and nature-based solution journey? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Shar. Um, uh, what, a, what an inspiring and uh, fantastic um, presentation and overview of the circular economy. And uh, and thanks so much for that and for that very <laughs> kind introduction. I'm like, I'm really hoping I do not disappoint with this overview of the regenerative economy. Um, so I actually also have um, a couple of slides, but I actually think I might just um, I might just chat because um, I think, oh no, I'll do the slides, I'll do the slides. You know what, I'm gonna go to 180, I'm gonna do the slides. Um, here we go. Um, so as Shar was mentioning, oh, here we go. Can everybody see that? Okay, can everybody see the slides? 
Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so as, uh, as Shar was mentioning, I work, um, I'm a researcher at the university. Uh, I'm a graduate student doing research in the geography department, but I also last year was working on the circular economy lab um, and still involved in the circular economy lab at the Said Business School. Um, I'm staying in Oxford for another year as next year I start my MBA at the business school. Um, and before coming to Oxford, I spent four years working at um, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is um, like a large umbrella organization that works on um, a whole range of conservation issues. Um, and actually, my team at IUCN was under the Nature Based Solutions umbrella at IUCN. So I worked in their marine and polar program, working on plastic pollution in marine environments. Um, so I wanted to start off with this thread of circularity and talking about the circularity uh, calculator um, and talking about these few things that we need to consider when we're looking at circularity. So um, what are our material inputs? Um, how, how does that compare to the linear option? What are the labor inputs going into, uh, if it's a if, if it's a product, this is um, not product of service, but if it's a product, um, you know, what are what are the labor inputs and what what about those are are different from the from the kind of traditional option? Um, what are the energy inputs? I mean, Shar was just talking about the renewable energy capacity and um, and how that might change the game in terms of our energy inputs. We talk about carbon footprint and we talk about the balance of trade as well. So um, the import and export looking at different um, options. I mean, sometimes if you look at the carbon calculator of making something domestically, it might be higher or it might be lower. There's a lot of kind of supply chain considerations that need to go into that. Um, but beyond circularity, oh, I wanted to talk about the regenerative economy. Um, and just by a show of hands, I wanted to see how many people have looked at this model or looked at regenerative models in the past. Okay, great. That's cool. That's good. That means that this was a, a use, useful use of time. Um, so this is a model from someone named Bill Reed. Um, and I actually think that Bill Reed needs a new graphic designer, uh, but I do think that it does. it is kind of a, an interesting insight into what we mean by the regenerative economy. So at the bottom of, um, of the kind of the swirl, is the degenerating economy, the conventional practice, which, uh, as he likes to put it, is one step better than breaking the law. Um, basically, all of these companies that are doing their business and doing that at the expense of people and the planet. Um, then there are kind of this this next uh, this next step, which is which is green economies, which is a relative improvement over what was done before. So let's say you have um, you know, a LEED certification on your building and you're trying to make sure that the energy that you're using is renewable, but at the, at the core of it, your, um, your business output is still kind of doing bad. And it's part of the de degenerative economy, which is extracting natural resources, extracting labor, and not really giving anything back into the system from which you've pulled. Then there's the sustainable economy, which is basically, I really like this term, 100% less bad. And this is where I think actually that the um, circular economy falls into. So making sure that we are closing this loop and that we're keeping a neutral impact. And I think that is often where we kind of end the circular economy engagement. I think that the circular economy is already so much so much further above um, what what our conventional practices and as as anybody in this room will know that it takes a huge amount of effort and engagement in order to get to that point where you're 100 percent less bad but the problem is is that there are so many steps above that and what i like about this kind of swirl even though i think bill reed needs a, needs a new graphic designer i do like the swirl about showing that circularity is only one step on the path to a regenerative economy so by a regenerative economy, um, there are kind of three steps on the way to a regenerative economy, starting with um, restorative. So making sure that um, not only are we doing 100% less bad or keeping closed loops, but we're making sure that we're restoring the parts of nature that have previously been kind of um, neglected or, uh, or abused at the hands of these kind of uh, degrading economies. So making sure that we're restoring ecosystems that have previously been degraded. And so that kind of brings back up to, you know, let's say 80% of what we what we'd like uh, in in our in our natural capacity. Um, and then there's uh, reconciliatory, which is kind of a little bit more um, 
uh, it sounds a little bit new age in the way that it's put there, but I actually do think it's really important in viewing, instead of viewing ourselves as separate from nature, really understanding that we're a part of nature and that humans not only have a critical role to play and businesses not only have a critical role to play in making sure that we're restoring the nature that we've degraded, but also even recognizing ourselves as part of that ecosystem and making sure that we're viewing ourselves as one and the same. So not only is it, you know, um, people and planet over profit, but like we're all part of the same ecosystem. And then finally, regenerative, which is basically not only is your company or your ent ent enterprise or your initiative getting to that point where you're 100% less bad or getting to the point you're, where you're restoring ecosystems, you're actually by virtue of what you're doing with your company, you're actually regenerating new ecosystems or regenerating new nature-based solutions through your company. Um, so again, by a quick show of hands, um, how many people have heard of nature-based solutions before? Okay. That's good, that's good. So um, nature-based solutions, just to give a, a very quick, like, I don't like definitions, but I do think it's actually quite helpful. And this one is from IUCN, oh geez. This one is from IUCN, my former, uh, my former organization. So I, I had to include it. Um, but it's basically nature-based solutions are looking at the range of, so I'll, I'll read this out just so we have uh, kind of a common understanding. So the actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Okay, so it sounds like uh, this amazing, wonderful thing. Why would anybody be against nature-based solutions? What we're looking at is basically seeing that nature offers us a lot of solutions to our climate problems, to our social problems, just by a at the very at the very basis and um, this kind of 100% less bad, making sure that we are. Um, let's say, for example, okay, I, coming from an oceans perspective, I worked on oceans before coming to Oxford, um, making sure that we are maintaining the capacity of the ocean to um, absorb carbon, for example, which has been happening for hundreds of years, or thousands of years, millions of years, actually, um, making sure that we're kind of not not exhausting the ocean as a carbon sink, making sure that we're not um, we're not overfishing the ocean and making sure so let's let's take overfishing as an example. If we had enough fish in our ecosystem, first of all, everything happens, uh, everything is in kind of uh, flow in the ocean. In, in terms of uh, having enough fish in the ocean, means that the coral reefs are kept in, in they're well maintained, which makes sure that other ecosystems in the in the ocean are able to thrive. Which means that the people who depend on the ocean for fish and for their livelihoods are also able to thrive. And so. Um, I also worked on mangroves for a long time, um, which is basically these kind of uh, um, blue carbon ecosystems. So ecosystems that are not only, that are kind of in this weird boundary between being land ecosystems and marine ecosystems, because mangroves are trees that kind of grow out of, out of, uh, out of salty um, water. And so if we, if we maintain mangroves, if we make sure at the very basis that we're not cutting them down, but we're actually planting them, we can not only absorb carbon, but we can create nurseries for fish that they can thrive. And so basically showing that nature-based solutions offer us, not, if not only if we preserve them, but if we actually add to them, there are so many solutions that we are kind of putting, um, putting out of the out of our, our Rolodex of, of, of initiatives. So for example, um, the, there's, a many term nature based solutions is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of um, a lot of different um, sorry I, I did not have enough coffee this morning I feel like my brain is lagging um, nature based solutions are kind of an umbrella term for um, ecosystem based adaptation so adaptation is how we're responding to climate change so things like instead of having a seawall I know I'm giving a lot of ocean examples sorry instead of having a seawall you would instead just make sure that you're reforesting mangroves because mangroves naturally dissipate like waves uh, and so that if there's a storm that in, it, in, it, in order to have better flood defenses or to be able to have better storm defenses, instead of cutting mangroves down and putting up a seawall, you would actually just have more mangroves there and plant more mangroves because not only are they absorbing carbon, they're also protecting you from uh, storms and they're providing nurseries for new fish. So basically looking at nature as a way to um, to, for, to ad ad adapt and also ecosystem-based mitigation, which is basically making sure that we're preserving forest areas that are absorbing carbon. Um, there are also kind of bigger umbrella terms. So green infrastructure is, is a big kind of hot topic right now in nature-based solutions. So how are we making sure that buildings are not, you know, concrete is like a, is a huge, very carbon intensive industry. So instead of using concrete, how are we using natural building materials or how are we having living walls or other um, green infrastructures that that allow us to basically create little hubs uh, within urban centers that are absorbing carbon and also you know um, absorbing uh, car 
absorbing carbon and also um, creating like, for example, pollination sites for bees. Um, and so I, I just wanted to highlight nature-based solutions because I think that there's a kind of confusion in the uh, in the in industri industry world of nature-based solutions versus uh, natural climate solutions. Um, so nature-based solutions are essentially looking at ecosystems in a very holistic way. So we're not only only looking at ecosystems as carbon sinks, which is what a lot of um, industry and or um, people in the environmental world are guilty of. So we say we should preserve this forest or we should preserve these mangroves because over a thousand years they'll absorb X tons of carbon. Um, and that's that's helpful. I mean, I think we're at a, such a desperate point in the climate crisis that it is important to preserve these natural carbon storing um, um, ecosystems. But ecosystems are a lot more than just carbon or a lot more than just carbon sinks. And um, so again, I'll come back to, to mangroves again, but um, if we looked at mangroves just through their carbon capacity, there's actually very little reason to preserve or to plant new mangroves because new, new mangroves actually don't absorb that much carbon. Um, and they're kind of often disregarded as like a, as a climate solution because um, it's only when a mangrove has been quite old, is quite old that they're able to, to absorb a significant amount of carbon. But if you look at them from a nature-based solutions lens and looking at all the ecosystem benefits that are, are, are there by keeping them, um, it, it becomes much more compelling reason to add to this kind of model of nature-based solutions. Um, and so I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is basically that there's a temptation, especially in the circular economy world, to look at things only from their carbon footprint, to look at things only at getting to that uh, sustainable 100% less bad and making sure that you're closing the loop on the impacts that you're having on the environment. But I think it's also important to look at where and how you can actually add to these nature-based solutions. So what kind of, um, what, along what parts of your supply chain are there opportunities to um, not only neutralize, but actually add to, um, to the kind of ecosystems from which you're pulling um, or the uh, communities from which you're pulling. So there's kind of these two twin pillars of regeneration, which is um, ecologically regenerative, which is what I've talked about in terms of uh, nature-based solutions and, and natural ecosystems, but also socially regenerative. And um, I really like Elvis and Cressy as an example of this because um, not only are they pulling from waste products to make these luxury luxury goods that they're selling, um, which are attractive and, and easy, but they're also what I, I would say that makes Elvis and Cressy circular because they're pulling from waste and making something new, but they're actually regenerative in that they're socially regenerative. So they have this social purpose that is much beyond um, getting profits and just kind of making sure that the, that waste is out of circulation. They have this very clear social goal of supporting um, uh, firefighters, or I actually don't know what they're called here, fire we call them firefighters in camp. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, of supporting firefighters who have gone through uh, and to in order to help them um, in their mental health and like kind of the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that they experience from fighting fires. So I would say there are two kind of twin pillars to always look at, either ecologically regenerative or socially regenerative. I mean, the the goal is to have basically um, all three of those, uh, all two of those and your profit. So three kind of pillars, ecologically and socially regenerative plus your profit. Um, and then I just wanted to say uh, uh, that we have this, this session um, at the November Dialogues and Race to Zero, and as well, sorry, I'm doing a lot of show of hands today. How many people have heard of Race to Zero or the November Dialogues? Um, okay, yeah, so um, I, I feel like the, the promo has been very much within the community of people who would already know about it rather than kind of like expand the tent. But so the COP26, which is the conference of parties that happens um, every year for uh, states to meet and discuss their climate commitments. Um, the COP26, obviously, that was meant to be this year in Glasgow was postponed to next year. And in its place, um, there's these kind of digital dialogues called the November Dialogues. And the frame of the November Dialogues is the race to zero. So the race to net zero um, is what it means. And it's basically a campaign to, to kind of um, include and, and uh, amplify the voices of non-state actors. So there's a series of, of um, sessions over 10 days um, from mostly non-state actors, from businesses, from cities, regions. Um, we're running one from the circular economy and our whole session um, is, is uh, and this is just a kind of promo for the race to zero. So a radical collaboration between cities, businesses, regions, and investors for a healthy, resilient zero carbon recovery. And so there's a theme for each day. Basically there's um, a theme on food and agriculture. There's a theme on uh, oceans, on forests, 
our, our day is on nature, the Nature Based Solutions Day, but we have a whole session um, on the 13th of November, which is uh, a week today, I guess, um, on, it's called Transitioning to a Regenerative and Circular Economy. And so uh, what will happen is that we will kind of overview what a regenerative economy means at the outset of the session. We have um, an academic lead. So um, as well, Oxford is, is huge on nature-based solutions research. We have a really good academic who um, is very embedded in this community, who's gonna be giving an overview of uh, what regenerative practices mean. And then we have four different um, business leaders from four different kind of levels of business. So we have a young entrepreneur, we have a startup, we have a medium enterprise, and then we have someone who's working at the logistical level of supply chains. And there we'll be, we'll be doing kind of a panel discussion about what regenerative practices mean, what they are, um, what they are, what the capacity for them is, what is what is the kind of lonely walk for leaders who are working in this area? Because I do recognize, and this is kind of the thing that I come back to again and again, is that, um, there are of course business cases for doing this kind of regenerative practice. It makes you a more resilient company. It makes you more, uh, it's it's very, uh, weirdly it's it's very risk averse because you're kind of getting ahead of the of these trends and making sure that you're um kind of grounding yourself in a business that will exist for 50 years rather than you know uh 20 years and then um be a part of this degenerative economy and not be able to give back but i would say that um i recognize that there's uh it's difficult to be an industry leader in this space because you're competing against people who are working in the degenerative economy and the struggle with that is that there's a lot of um Un, uh, intangible um, kind of funding that is coming from the earth, basically that they're not paying for because they're not giving back to it. And so it's very difficult and I really recognize that. And so what we're trying to do in this, uh, in this session is basically just give a toolkit to businesses who are interested in the regenerative economy. And then I'll just finish off by just giving a plug for this uh, Circular Economy Lab. Although that's an old uh, photo, I think we're now rebranding as the Regenerative and Circular Economy Lab. And we're always really interested to work um, with, with small businesses, with medium businesses, large businesses on doing collaborations. And, and what we'd love to do is basically for you guys to come with a problem that you're looking on how you transition to a circular economy and kind of use the hive mind of students who are really interested in this space to help you uh, problem solve that. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back over for questions. Cool, thank you very much. Um, I, that, was, right, that was fascinating, I love that. There's a number of things that struck me, I mean, all the way through both Charmian and, and yourself, Alexis. Um, I really love the idea of looking back to look forward um, and how there's a lot of value within that. Um, I also, I hadn't really thought about circular integration in terms of strategy instead of vertical and horizontal. So, you know, I thought there was a lot of value in that too. Um, and equally about change needing to be systemic and therefore needing to be cultural too. Um, I'll admit as well, I'm also, even though this is sort of what I do, I'm, I think I've been guilty of stopping halfway up that regenerative spiral um, and I've made a note to myself to go and actually give much more thought to nature-based solutions um, in terms of the rules that were in that. Just one question on that. I think it's easy to, to see though nature-based solutions as being sort of difficult to do or expensive, but actually I think from hearing you talk, there's certainly a large part of it is actually just about trying to get people thinking about these. Would you say that's right? And if that's the case, is there an opportunity for us to even just start to talk a little bit more about this kind of thing? Is that something that would be advantageous? I mean, I definitely think that the the way that nature based solutions are being operated right now is that they're it's it's very much at a, a state level, and so it's funding that you get in order you get a pool of funding. I mean, this is how we used to at IUCN all the time. Uh, you get a pool of funding from some government in order to work on a on a re regenerative ecosystem, rather than having any private sector like influence or playing a role in that. And so I think it would just be really cool to see more people in the private sector um, uh, talking about nature based solutions and the capacity for like innovative funding uh, capacities, or even just talking about um, the responsibility for nature-based solutions that falls that shouldn't fall just on on governments, um, which I think is what's happening uh, for a large part of the time now. Can I, can I jump in? Because actually, I think one of the projects we're also keen. So I mentioned that we're looking at circular integration and looking for some companies that might be interested in sort of piloting some some thinking around that. But I, we're also in the early stages of mapping out what a playbook for regenerative business models, nature based solution business models, models could look like. And so if any of you are interested in being a part of that sort of learning journey, um, again, as Alexa said, I think we'd love to love to chat to you about it. Um, and and I ho I'm hopeful that within the regenerative and circular economy lab, which I just I just want to make a note is actually now as of, of this year, again, renamed the regenerative and circular economy for sort of some of the things we've been talking about, but also is really importantly, a joint 
um, initiative of both the side business school and the school center, which is obviously where the business students are, along with um, the School of Geography. Um, and so, so our view is really the importance of bringing together business practice and science, climate science. And ultimately that's how we are moving forward with the Regenerative and Circular Economy Lab. So all of you that are interested in better understanding the science and how these things work from a more ecosystem-based approach and le leveraging the real expertise of people um, that are, are deeply involved in nature-based solutions and, and what this looks like and, and thinking about how to put it into practice within business. Like that is the adventure <laughs> that we're, we're kind of signing up for, eh, Alex, Alexis, with, um, with the work that, that's happening. So uh, we really welcome um, friends and fellow travelers as, as we learn together. Definitely. And just one last uh, uh, kind of plug for that is just that um, the, I've noticed since coming to, to Oxford that there is such a bubble of academia where we feel like everybody knows these kinds of things and everybody understands what regenerative or nature-based solutions are. And it's so helpful for us to get a kind of um, grounding in what practitioners are, are, are looking at and what the day-to-day -day constraints are. Because I, I think it's very easy to sit in an ivory tower and be like, well, all you would need to do would be to change your supply chain at the origin, blah, blah, blah. So I think it would be really cool um, for as many of you to get engaged with the circular economy because it's uh, the business school is this really cool um, in between world in that it's it's in the university but it also is very much influenced by practitioners um, and has practitioners flowing in and out of it so we would love to to hear from you i'll, I'll put my email in the um chat if anybody wants to reach out cool that'd be great and um, that was actually my main question was actually going to be yeah how can we help you and what opportunities are there for us to be working with yourselves and things like that so you've covered that off well i think the only final one i had for the november dialogue you've got in the session of the 13th if you Either let me have the details of that I'll send it around or pop that in the chat as well. Um, I'm sure there'll be people on the line to be interested in that too. Yeah, definitely. Um, you can register and that's actually a whole day of really great, I mean, there's a whole 10 days of really great sessions. So I really recommend that people check it out. Um, but of course, I would love to see you at this session because I think it will be hopefully interesting or practical um, for people who are interested in this space. Cool. Any questions from anyone else? Marvelous. I think you well, you have our addresses. So please, if you've got questions, I know we're kind of coming up on 1030, but please get in touch. You, the stuff that you guys are all working on is so precious because you're, you guys, Alexa said, you're, you're putting it in, into practice and we just want to be supportive and help and learn from, from all of you. So please, please um, don't hesitate to get in touch um, for, for whatever, whatever you're interested in discussing. I think we're, we're keen to, to, to have that discussion. Cool. I would cool. actually... I was sorry, I just, uh, I know we're coming up on 10.30, but I actually think it would be kind of interesting. And Andrew, maybe if I can send you, I think it'd be cool to centralize some of this stuff so that we're not just having everyone reach out individually. Um, I think it'd be kind of cool to, I could put together a couple of questions about like, what are the kind of uh, struggles with circular or regenerative practices? And then we can kind of centralize them and maybe group people according to what those problems might be. And then we can kind of see, that would be maybe a better. Yeah, great you idea. Need practice, love it. Happy to be uh, use me as the point for that, but that sounds great. But final thing then is really just to say thank you to both of you for that. I really appreciate it. that was a super session. Really enjoyed it, and um, yeah. So thank you very much for your time. I know you're already really busy, but yes, applause. <laughs> All right, guys, look at that. We stayed within ten thirty as well, which was my promise to Charmian and Alexis as well as you guys. <laughs> so well done, everyone, and go off enjoy your Friday. And yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank, right. you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.